Welcome to our talk show live here on NTV as we discuss the status of housing in Uganda and why housing actually matters to you, to me, and to the entire nation. It's brought to you by Habitat for Humanity Uganda, supported by the Ministry of Lands, Housing and Urban Development, as well as a partnership with Housing Finance Bank. Once again, you're live and welcome to NTV 4 p.m. It is and it's time for a live talk show with the status of housing in Uganda and why exactly it matters. As the country's population shoots up, the need for housing units also does go up. And by the end of this year, Uganda will have a population of about 48 million people, thereby raising the housing deficit to more than 3 million. And by the year 2025, you won't believe it, we may be at the population status of 52 million Ugandans in the country, thereby raising the housing deficit by 2025 to 4 million people. Now, we do have some tough questions we then have to ask ourselves in this regard, and with two years left to us getting to 2025, some of the tough questions lead us to the five W's. And why is this conversation on housing important to you, to me, and to the nation? Who is concerned about it, individuals, NGOs, or government? Where is the current status of housing and what kind of housing enhances the livelihood of a people such as Ugandans? Where are the less privileged groups in this conversation, namely women, children, young people, but also persons with disabilities? And what are the present favorable policies that can improve habitation on a national level? Now here to help us understand us and help us to understand this, guide us on the way forward and also maybe shine us some light into 2020 and what the solutions would have been by then is uh, Mr. Robert Otim, who's Habitat for Human Humanity's National Director. Good afternoon to you, Robert. Good afternoon. You're most welcome. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. All right. We are also joined by John Baptist Kawesi, who's the Head Mortgage and Consumer Banking, that is at Housing Finance Bank. Thank you. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. And of course, we do have Mr. Kayanga Yanga, David, who's the Director for Housing and Human Settlements at the Ministry of Lands, Housing and Urban Development. Mr. Kayanga Yanga, you're most welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, viewers, and it's a pleasure that we are right here on NTP. Okay. All right. So I will start with you, Robert. Tell us about Habitat for Humanity Uganda. What was the vision and the mission, and what were you trying to solve in our country that led to the existence of the organization? Thank you, thank you so much. And um, Habitat for Humanity I Uganda is uh, an indigenous organization locally registered in the country and is affiliated to Habitat for Humanity International, which is a global organization. We are in over 70 countries across the world and uh, all over the United States of America. And uh, we, as Habitat for Humanity, do exist because uh, humanity is part of our DNA. And uh, we, uh, as an organization, as a global network, we uh, stand for uh, ensuring that everyone lives decently and thrives decently all over the world. And that's the same vision that we have here in the country. And how do we do this? We bring people together collectively. We have government here, we have the private sector, housing finance bank, to be able to build resilience, to build the strength, to build the stability within the communities that is where we work. And that is uh, our, our, our mission in the country. We have been in Uganda now for 40 years. And since our inception in 1982, we have been able to build, improve over 200,000 homes across the country, impacting over 100, uh, 1.5 million Ugandans across the, the, the country. That, of course, uh, said is a very, very a small contribution to the sector, considering the need that we have currently. 
Okay, speaking of contributions, I have learned of Evelyn Virawanatnachaze, and she's in Mukono, Kaladri, uh, to be exact, in the trading center. And she had three children, biological, and she was taking care of another two. But her state of housing was so terrible, she feared for the next day. And in such a rainy season, obviously, survival was def dangerous, not just for her, but also for the children. Uh, could you share about that testimonial? Because in her testimonial of the work that you did uh, through your NGO, she said, I'm no longer the woman who lives in a mud and water collapsing house. Kaladi resident as she received the housing from Habitat for Humanity. So tell us about these kind of testimonials and how they've been able to transform society. The transformational impact of housing is so amazing. Uh, globally, we have undertaken a lot of research into the impact of housing to the livelihoods, to the economy, to the health, of uh, the people that we serve. Uh, this lady in Mukono, particularly, is, is among the very many dire families and women who need this support. I particularly visited, when I joined Habitat for Humanity, I had opportunity to visit one of the communities, and the situation was so dire that you, you, you hardly come, without sh come back without shedding tears in that community. This was a family, she had nine children in a, a very small place. She had a goat, she had chicken, and every time it rains, it's just a total scare. Children have to stand, others have to move to the neighborhoods to sleep. We are faced with that challenge, and as we speak today, over 10 million people, over 10 million Ugandans do not have a place uh, to call home. Globally, we are looking at over 1.6 billion people living in very indecent conditions. And the World Bank estimates today one in four of the people need accommodation, need decent housing. And by 2035, almost 40 percent of the world population will need new housing and basic services. That's how the situation is dire. And also UN estimates the World Health Organization, over 10 million people globally die because of poor housing conditions. So the situation that we are grappling with is so huge that it needs collective effort and the urgency that it deserves now more than ever before. Thank you so much, Robert. I'll turn to John Baptist as a housing finance bank, a public limited company regulated by the Bank of Uganda and also under Financial Institutions Act. Why was Housing Finance Bank uh, set up in the first place? What was that problem, according to you, that you were trying to solve? Uh, thank you so much for that question. Um, that's an interesting question because it aligns with our purpose. Our purpose is very clear. It also aligns with uh, the reason why Housing Finance Bank is in place today. Um, our purpose is to enable home ownership and financial inclusion independence. Uh, so for the past 54 years we've been providing housing uh, financing services to our customers and we shall continue doing that. But beyond that, uh, picking from what my colleagues said, all mentioned, these challenges are uh, before all of us, whether you are a bank, whether you are the government, whether you are the NGO, at the end of the day we need to work together to see how we can uh, solve some of the problems that we have. He has talked about the housing deficit which is growing currently at about 2.4 million housing units and that number is growing every year. But it's not about how many houses. There's also the life in the brick and mortar or the buildings that we are talking about. He has given an example of the lady and that's a project we worked on together jointly uh, it's so touching. Personally, I was there during the handover. Mm -hmm. I met the lady. I met the daughters. The daughters were in tears. It was so touching looking at where they are coming from and where they are. So there's also the life uh, within that building that we are talking about. So when it rains, what happens? You're enjoying your, your sleep in the night, but you have to wake up. You have so many things to worry about. So if you're living with animals in the same house, in the same building, what kind of life is that? So we are here to work with the different stakeholders and partners to make sure that we, we, we reduce some of these challenges before us.
okay. as, a, as, as, as a country. All right, thank you, John Baptist. So there's the building, then there's the life behind yeah. the building. Now, to be a part of this conversation across uh, social media platforms, hashtag Habitat uh, for Humanity, hashtag UG housing and then those are the hashtags you should be following in case you want to you just check out these conversations also on our twitter page which is ntv uganda and on facebook you can be able to get the streaming links and also stream live as well as on youtube i will turn to the government that is being represented under the ministry of lands housing and urban development mr kayangayanga you do have an ngo that has existed in helping the government solve the problem of housing for 40 years you do have housing bank that has also been here for an incredible number of years, uh, still also aiding in the government to bridge the gap between housing and so on and so forth. Uh, from government's perspective, what are those reforms policies that have aided um, such parties to actually be able to then put in their efforts to create a livelihood for people in Uganda? Uh, thank you so much for inviting me, first of all, uh, on behalf of government. Uh, first of all, I would want to state that uh, housing is one of the fundamental rights and it is a basic need. You and me and each of the viewers must have something which they call shelter, a roof over their head. And uh, coming back uh, to your question, indeed we have uh, uh, players in this sector, including financial institutions, including the NGOs, and uh, we cannot underestimate their role. They play a very significant role in the delivery of housing, especially when it comes to habitat for humanity Uganda, for the most vulnerable in, uh, in society. So it is, uh, they are among those partners that we, we work with. But as government, uh, our role is pro to provide uh, a conducive environment by providing the policy framework under which we operate by providing the regulatory framework and generally the legal framework to make it conducive so that the various players can enjoy the environment in which they, they work and therefore uh, deliver on the housing. Uh, having said that, uh, housing is very broad. Of course, you mentioned the housing deficit of, uh, of around 2.5, 2.4 and still growing. But of course, we should know that uh, countrywide, we have close to 900 housing units. And the deficit is what the suppliers must address. In fact, if you're an investor and you go to a country and there's no deficit, then you don't even invest in housing. But I'm not saying that deficit is a good thing. This, this is where we need concerted efforts, uh, both at the individual level, uh, both at, uh, at, the, at the CBO and the NGO level and the financial institutions because one of the major challenges we have is uh, housing finance, not only housing finance but long-term housing finance. But we are working with the partners to ensure that we improve uh, this area because everyone must move on and must be housed adequately so we shouldn't leave anybody behind. Thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, Robert, what's the current state of housing in Uganda? And if not addressed, what's the future of that for, for our people here? Uh, just like the director has mentioned, and um, the situation is dire in the country. And uh, you rightly place the population projections. Looking at those population projections, the issue of urbanization is a crisis in the looming because the need is going to continue to grow. There is going to be a need for more basic services every day to match the demand of the pressure that is being caused by the demographic trends. Just to, to give you uh, an example of the bulging young generation in the country that are not very productive, but they require to be meaningfully engaged Th this sector is a latent sector that can provide opportunity to employ young people in this country. We have already had uh, evidence in many of the countries where we work, including Uganda. To build one home, we can employ between three to five young people decently for a period of at least uh, three to six months. 
if we, for instance, say, okay, let the sector inject at least about 1,000 homes in, in a year, 1,000 houses, the figures can tell how many young people can be employed in this country. Then, of course, uh, the framework that government is already uh, uh, providing for the private sector. The private sector is another entity that can be able to cause huge transformation and even a reversal of the economic trends that have been caused by the global pandemic, the COVID-19. We, we know that if we prioritize housing, we can be able to increase our GDP to close to 20%. Uh, right now we are speaking of a contribution of about 11%. When we look at our neighboring countries, Kenya, Rwanda, the contribution of housing sector into the GDP is over 20%. And so this is a huge opportunity for government and the various partners to come together to be able to engage deeply into the housing sector. It will cause huge transformation economically, socially, even, even politically within the country because we will have young people productively engaged and not going to do other things that can cause social uh, conflict within the communities that we work. Okay. All right. Private sector is being represented here and uh, the word framework has appeared twice. So I will want to find out from you, John, does the present regulatory framework actually enable you to thrive in ensuring that uh, housing is covered but it's covered at the most affordable cost? Uh, thank you very much uh, for your question. Uh, what I can say is, yes, the framework is conducive, but there are challenges, um, like my colleagues spoke about, that need to, we need to be very deliberate about uh, resolving some of those challenges. Because I'll tell you, you you'll see so many developers uh, participating within this space. They are providing these services, but there are challenges around affordability. At the end of the day, uh, the developers are running a business and, and they know if I put up 100 units, each is sold at say 200 million, mm -hmm. I'm going to sell them out, for example, within two years time. But the bigger challenge is for the masses, not for, for you and me. Uh, the masses are not uh, privileged. Um, my colleagues spoke about um, the widows, uh, the, 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 the orphans, the elderly people. So when you look at their needs and the affordability aspect, it remains a challenge. I think we need to work together to come up with solutions. And I'll speak for the private sector, specifically Housing Finance Bank. What we've done in this aspect is to use the insights that we've been collecting over time from our customers, from within the communities from which we operate, to come up with solutions that are, that are speaking to the reality. Uh, talking of affordability, we came up with a product that we call incremental housing loan. And we know most of us have been building houses from phases from one phase to another incrementally. That's why we're using the word incremental housing. So I don't have, say, 100 million to put up a house today, but I can start with 3 million. And 3 million, I know what it can do for me as a Ugandan. It can help me with a foundation. At some point, I resume and put up maybe the slab, the walls, and so on and so forth. So we put in place this product to cater for anyone who has a dream of only owning a house as low as 200,000 shillings in terms of the loan amount. So we are not talking about hundreds of millions. If your need is one million, if you are a market vendor and all you need is one million to start on your foundation, we are able to support you through that program. Uh, so that is one of the things uh, we've done to make sure that we get closer to closing that critical gap that we have. Okay. But still there's a lot of room uh, for improvement in terms of the framework. Allow me to pick your minds on um, housing, uh, especially in the urban areas. Most recently, we did have uh, NSSF launching the new housing uh, estate in Luar. And I'll, I'll start from Mr. Kayangayanga's perspective. Uh, what do you make of uh, this uh, wave of new housing units that were set up there? And uh, 
who's going to be living in them? <laughs> Ugandans will be living in them. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what I can say is that uh, when we talk of housing, then there are segments. There's what we call the upper segment, uh, the middle segment, and uh, the lower segment. And uh, you will agree with me that uh, the upper segment usually is well housed. And when we talk of the housing deficit, we're actually talking of the lower segment, which does not have mm. access uh, to, uh, to adequate finance. So uh, what we need to, the discussion we need to, to take on is how do we address the houses of the majority of Ugandans who are in the, in the lower uh, bracket. And of course, to do this, the number of innovations and initiatives that must be uh, be undertaken. Of course, it has mentioned the incremental uh, housing development uh, loan, which is very critical. But uh, as government, we also know that another approach can be uh, the housing cooperatives. We have seen scenarios where people go alone to build a foundation. Maybe you reach you reach a ring beam, or you reach a uh, window level, and the the money is is finished. It's done. So that is what we call dead stock. But we are encouraging and we have a unit in the housing directorate that is focusing on helping uh, people to come up with housing cooperatives to ensure that they can pull resources, build one at a go or build a number at a go. And at the end of it, you don't have dead stock, but you are housed in phases. So we are also encouraging uh, housing savings and circles towards that kind of arrangement in order to mobilize what we call non-formal housing finance. And the number of deliberate actions uh, by government and uh, our partners to ensure that the most vulnerable part of, of society gets access uh, to housing, including uh, the mortgage for those who can afford and then the non-formal finance the different systems for those who are vulnerable and in the lower cadre of the society. For those who can afford, for those who are vulnerable, uh, that's a big margin. Uh, when we look at our neighboring countries, in Rwanda as a government, they have actually been doing a lot of housing uh, for those who cannot afford and mm -hmm. the vulnerable more than those who can actually afford. Now, the irony of it is that here in Uganda, we seem to be focusing on what you termed as the high uh, and not the middle or even the lower class. And so you're having Habitat for Humanity uh, coming out to address the, you know, the ones that are the bottom of this chain you're having the housing finance bank coming to address the middle now there's a big gap in addressing housing for those that cannot afford completely uh, or even the very minimal income earners especially given the fact that we are post COVID-19 people are uh, more or less trying to recover left right and center you all have children I'm pretty sure school fees has become uh, an arm and a leg for pulling in terms of returning the kids to school so uh, th there's so many other things and factors that are causing people to actually choose to be in that dire state in terms of housing yet it affects the rest of them so I, I will turn to uh, Robert and find out from you in terms of uh, your organization and uh, focusing on the needs of the less privileged as uh, uh, Dev has called them in regards to the vulnerable groups tell us about how you've been able to address their housing and exactly how you've been able to do that because I know it's their mindset is one of the challenges that hinders them from ensuring that they get better housing for themselves Prisla, I like your analogy Regarding just the, if I can just contribute a little to, to the subject that you, the question that you asked mm -hmm. about the NSSF recently, huge milestone. Uh, Habitat for Humanity has prioritized four core areas in terms of uh, ensuring that they can strongly address the needs in Africa. One of them is affordability. We have spoken about affordability, and I'll come back to it to, 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 to respond to the question that you raised. Habitability is where we are dealing with um, the, the, the very less privileged communities, uh, that the question that you've just asked me. Then basic services, and uh, we have the security of tenure, something that we are not touching, but we know that in Uganda it's a complex one as well, and directly links to, to housing. Now, back to the issue of affordability. Uh, Knight Frank uh, published a report recently, 2021, 
uh, Uganda is uh, ranked almost uh, um, among the top. It's fourth in terms of the issues around affordability and deficit in Africa. Af being in, in Kampala, for instance, uh, for is if, if we take an average income earner, he needs nearly 50% of his income to rent an apartment or a small house here in Kampala. And what does that mean? It means that we, a, a family of such a kind is left with no income, is every time in dire situation. So we will need to, as a sector, as a country, to adapt a system thinking approach, whereby we consider housing at a more systemic level, looking at it uh, broadly rather than uh, uh, letting it to the private sector, letting it to the government, letting it to the civil society, but coming up with solutions that can encourage integration of housing across the sectors. Then number two, uh, of course, they are, they are, we, we have talked about framework, frameworks. Uh, recently, the cost of materials skyrocketed. But every year in this country, the cost of building materials still have to go up. Regulation is going to be very important. And we have very good uh, uh, policies that need just to be applied. And then uh, you asked about uh, the focus on the vulnerable or less privileged communities in this country. That is the largest population that we are faced with in this country. When you look at the real estate and what is being developed, it is to only about 20% of the higher segment that the director pointed out. And so I, I was, I, I was um, uh, reflecting when you said, who is going to be in these houses? And uh, Ugandans are going to be there. Indeed, yes, Ugandans. But of I, I, you, you're saying Ugandans, but I've seen the reality. <laughs> uh, there's blocks that came up in Nalia. Nalia yeah. has become, you know, sort of the new residential. Uh -huh. And uh, on those blocks, one time I visited someone in one of those uh, housing units, mm -hmm. and uh, they have what used to be the boarding school where they put the names, uh, mm -hmm. school fees defaulters. Now in this housing estate, that board is there to show defaulters. Mm -hmm. of people who haven't paid their rent, how much they've not paid over what period of and time they've not paid it. Mm -hmm. But they are the ones that are being targeted who, quote unquote, mm -hmm. a class can afford or we think they can afford. But then there's the question of sustainability of affordability. That is not being addressed because today I may have the job that can allow me to have and afford that housing. Tomorrow mm -hmm. that may change. Yeah. And, and then what happens? So I, I want to find out from you, uh, um, Dave, then what happens? happens because these units will become empty which means that will be a less shilling to what is coming into the pockets of government which means then on terms of delivery of services to the rest of the other groups middle and less privileged that you mentioned it's going to be limited yeah, uh, thank you so much uh, Sila. this is a very very critical question I don't want to ask which time did you go there but the impact of COVID has had very serious uh, very serious effects, n mainly on housing. To the extent that uh, during that time when the government was trying to give some food stuff to some sections of society, and uh, where they required to write a, a number on a door to indicate you have got, some didn't have even a door. They were just there, especially in the, uh, in the urban areas. But uh, having said that, of course the question of affordability is critical. And um, here we are talking of affordability in terms of ownership and affordability in terms of rent. I've always said that uh, not everybody can own a house, especially in the urban setting. But everybody should be able to rent a house at reasonable rates. And a reasonable, it means that uh, should be in housing context, should not take more than 30% of the household uh, income. So which means, but, but that means that it will also depend on the, on the owners or the suppliers. So the issue is what are some of the interventions that we should put in place uh, to ensure that uh, that form of housing 
is affordable, both at the ownership and, uh, and the rental level. And this, in, in terms of the inputs in the building, inputs in materials that are used, and those are the debates that uh, are going on, the question of land, the question of whether the land is blind available, because you agree with me that uh, around 30% of the house cost in Uganda goes into infrastructure the roads, the water, the electricity. So that's where government is coming in to ensure that all those can be provided by government to ensure that we lessen uh, the cost. And of course this need, this means bringing on board uh, the various players, Umeme, National Water, uh, the local government with fiscal planning, the central government with the, with the road provision, to ensure that at least a, a reasonable uh, percentage of the cost that goes into housing is met uh, by, by, the, by the center to ensure that we have uh, affordable uh, housing. All right. Uh, David says COVID-19 is one of the major current contributing factors to the poor state of housing in Uganda. Um, okay. John Baptist. Um, uh, First, give me a comment on the NSSF housing in Lua. <laughs> uh, I won't differ from what my two colleagues have said. I think we can't take away, we can't, we can't run away from the segmentation. Um, any developer, um, as they develop or as they build the houses they are building, they have clarity on whom they are targeting. Are they targeting the apex player or are they targeting someone at the bottom of the pyramid? They are very clear on that. So I believe the houses that we are talking about, they are targeted uh, towards a very specific segment of customers. Okay, all right. So speaking of target, I know that uh, you're currently running a campaign, Zimba and Um So who are you targeting for this kind of campaign? Thank you very much. So um, we've opened all our doors and we are welcoming, welcoming everyone. What do I mean by that? We are not targeting a particular segment. Uh, maybe I'm looking for a $500,000 house, or I'm looking for 2 million shillings. W the campaign is targeting everyone because we have different products, different solutions for different customers. There are those, even if you tell them the house is 100 million, it has been, if you, if you take on the house during this period, I'm assuming I'm a developer. Uh, even if you tell them I'm giving you a discount of 10%, if you take up the house today, you're getting a 10% discount. They'll never own that house because it's a different profile, it's a different, um, it's a different segmentation. So the campaign is targeting everyone. We have the incremental housing loan product. That's a very key product in, and, and it's really exciting so many Ugandans because I spoke about uh, affordability, we are welcoming anyone. We are not talking about someone wearing a suit from eight to nine, even if I'm a market vendor, even if I'm a border border rider. We have so many touching stories of our customers that we, we have impacted with this particular solution. We are also serving uh, the high end customers who are looking for a house worth, say, one million dollar. We are providing all these solutions to everyone. Okay. It's all inclusive. All right, yeah. uh, now we may move on to the next question. Does the current state of housing actually rhyme with the World Habitat Day theme? World Habitat Day is going to be celebrated in October. And the theme is mind the gap, leave no one and place behind. Mind the gap, leave no one and place behind. Robert, in regards to this theme, um, we are past COVID-19, but it's not the only issue that we are being uh, challenged with here in Uganda. We have conflict uh, that is challenging habitation here in Uganda. Uh, DRC Congo has been having lots of issues. Therefore, we've been having people from the other side, eastern side of the border, crossing into Uganda and, of course, infringing on settlement. Uh, we have so many settlement caps across different parts of Uganda. After all, uh, Uganda is one of the most welcoming nations uh, for those that are in crisis therefore distorting the settlement of you know the native communities the people but also uh, infringing on the housing state of these different communities so from your perspective and through the 40 years of the organization how has conflict in particular actually altered and left some people behind and left some places empty or overutilized 
A very good question, Priscilla. I missed to answer uh, the first question that uh, you had asked me about how we handle the, the rural housing. Uh, if time allows, I would be able to speak to it. Now, conflict, climate, COVID, population, the demographics, those are into a mix. I would actually would like to respond to them uh, as, as, a, as a whole. But looking at uh, Uganda, I would say uh, for now, uh, the conflict you could also look at different uh, uh, angles. There are conflicts in our day-to-day -day life at the communities where we live, conflicts that are triggered on issues around security of tenure, conflicts that are uh, triggered uh, uh, across the border. As you say, we are always a welcoming country. But when these conflicts happen, do they find the communities ready to, to, to be able to host in terms of housing, habitability? When conflict happens, and, and for instance, if I talk about climate change, we have seen uh, floods and droughts hitting everywhere. Do these families recover from this stress, from these shocks of these conflicts, from these uh, climate variations? Hardly. The less privileged are even pushed further into poverty because whatever they have is always destroyed within conflict, within the climate variations, and so it takes a lot of time. And so if they say poverty perpetuates, so does poverty housing in this country. People who do not have homes will continue for long in Uganda without having homes. And so it calls for really very concerted efforts. And uh, again, uh, as Habitat for Humanity, we target the less privileged in the rural communities where we work. We have prioritized communities where the poverty levels are way beyond the national poverty headcount. That is in Teso, in, in, in parts of Busoga. Uh, in, 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 so those are areas that are in dire need in this country. And so what we do to try to uh, uh, support uh, issues around affordability, we have been able to, the microfinance institutions, the, the small community loans associations that are available, we build their capacity to be able to generate their own income and to be able to support each other to build homes incrementally. We have supported the financial institutions across the country by developing this housing product. And I'm very happy today that Housing Finance Bank here is confident and seeing it as a product that is going to cause more economic value and returns to the, to the, to the, to the, to the institution, but at the same time transforming lives across the country. This is the way to go. We would like to interest as many institutions, the private sector, even the small communities, to be able to do this. And uh, uh, linking it to affordability, Habitat for Humanity is also developing climate resilient technologies. We are working with partners like Technology for Tomorrow, Makere University, uh, to develop solutions locally. We have right now what we are calling the, the ISSB, the Interlocking Stabilized Soil Blocks. We have the, the flows that do not use cement. We are working with Earth Enable. We have um, uh, one of the, the institutions uh, in, in, in Uganda. It is um, uh, that, that participated in Africa Housing Forum. And we are having a symposium. We want to have these solutions uh, emerge locally within the country so that we can be able to provide solutions that can work for Ugandans and also drastically reduce the cost of housing in this country. We have set up regional youth hubs across now the country, one in Teso sub-region in Kumi, another one in Busoga. These are incubation centers, these are co-creation centers, one-stop centers where young people come together to learn these solutions that are going to uh, drastically reduce the cost of housing in this country. As we speak, we have trained so far 2,000 young people in the country, they are able to make these blocks, they are able to build these homes, and they are able to get some income and also support their families to build their resilience in the community that they are working. So collectively, and if we can integrate this not only in the housing sector, 
like for instance habitat for humanity many times they say it's about the, the, the roof and the walls no we have basic services we look at it holistically when we come to a home we know that there should be water and sanitation there should be skilling there should be livelihood opportunities for the family because when you have a house we need you to go beyond in terms of livelihood empowerment you need to have the cost of affording treatment health much lowered you should be able to sustain your child in school through to university so we see homes a house as a springboard as a catalyst as a foundation for breaking the cycle of poverty in this country and we as we take when we look at it in that way i think we can be able to see and also have the drive across the sector to be able to see housing as an opportunity rather than a very costly venture in the country opportunity versus costly venture uh, so we'll bring in the government dave uh, the theme mind the gap leave no one and place it behind this is a theme that is looking at the growing inequalities of housing and also the challenges that are being faced especially like in cities and uh, settlement communities in reference to this theme how does government intend to actually sort of amalgamate this into what you're currently doing uh, thank you so much uh, priscilla Indeed, everybody should mind the gap, especially the gap in terms of uh, deficit, the, the gap in terms of the quality of housing that we are delivering, uh, the gap in terms of uh, which section of population we are targeting. And of course, you have mentioned some of the conflicts, and given the fact that Uganda is one of the the countries actually this is the first country hosting the majority of of refugees in in the, in the world it is the first country in africa to have hosted the uh, european refugees from poland meted up for after world war, world war ii so when we talk of minding the gap uh, in in october as the theme under the world habitat day uh, we are we are we, we are going to sit with stakeholders and uh, and uh, of course uh, Habitat for Humanity Housing Finance Bank, among them, to look at what are the the gaps, how how big the gap is, what are the real issues that are affecting housing delivery and housing uh, affordability, uh, why is the deficit increasing, what are the various players, what are some of the issues that we can take on in terms of. Uh, housing finance in terms of uh, managing population in terms of, uh, of of the materials in terms of, uh, of 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 the finances in terms of of which role can each of the players play in 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 narrowing in narrowing this gap so the the, the, the october theme helps us to to review our our story to look at what we have done, what we haven't done, what we have done badly, and how best we can we can focus our resources, how best we can marshal both financial and other resources in order to uh, to narrow the gap. And of course, we are, we are ready and willing to work with the partners to ensure that we focus the real questions that touch each and every Ugandan, both in the urban and in the rural areas all right thank you so much dave world habitat day is actually celebrated on the first monday of october and it's seeking this time around in 2022 to draw attention to the growing inequalities and vulnerabilities that have been heightened by the triple c's which is covid 19 climate as well as conflict something that we are very familiar with here in uganda but away from that habitat for humanity celebrating 40 years and uh, they are doing it in a very interesting style they were set up in 1982 by the international organization and they've been here one of the things that they've been able to do in those 40 years is eliminate poverty housing in uganda kudos to you robert 40 years down the road a job evidently done uh, government does appreciate you and considers you a great partner in ensuring that they eliminate uh, poverty housing in uganda what's the plan for the next 40 years Wow, I like the thinking, 40 years, iterative. And that's the thinking, that's what housing needs. Think long term, not five years, 10 years, or 20 years. So 40 years is, is um, 
We, as Habitat for Humanity, like I mentioned earlier, we have already prioritized. We have uh, uh, an impact 2027 and impact 2050 strategic direction that we'd like to, to take. And one of them, uh, at, at the center of this, uh, this uh, strategic direction, we will participation is going to be critical. We want every less privileged, those that th the voices are not heard, to be at the center of our work. Because we know that they are the ones who are a majority and need the housing services. We have also prioritized the young generation. We need the youth to be at the center and to appreciate housing as a sector. A sector that has a lot of opportunities in terms of employment, a sector that is going to, to generate uh, uh, income and create resilience in the communities that they are working, a sector that is going to increase on the GDP in this country. So we are going to work closely with government and the different partners to be able to ensure that it is an appreciated sector that can drive uh, employment opportunities for this country. We are focused on four uh, priority areas that I've, 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 I've shared with you. Affordability is one thing. We are going to continue innovating and co-creating across the sector to develop solutions that are tailor-made, but at the same time, uh, climate resilient. We are going to uh, work with the academia. We, as Habitat for Humanity, we know the value of volunteers. And so we are going to ensure that we spread into the academic institutions, provide them opportunities to, to learn skills and appreciate housing at the very young tender ages, so that as they grow, they know that housing is indeed a foundation and a springboard to deliver other sustainable development goals. We are going to focus on basic services. I mentioned that we are taking housing holistically. For every house that we build, there should be basic services. There should be security. There should be t uh, of tenure, but at the same time, dignity, environment should be considered. So all that uh, holistic approach is going to continue as Habitat for Humanity. Gender is very important. We know what a house and a home means to a woman. And so we, I, I, as Habitat for Humanity, are going to consume, ensure that gender is integrated and mainstreamed in what we're doing as a country. But at the same time, I system at the wider sector, we need to ensure that uh, we work with the private sector, we work with government to see that the beautiful policies that we have are actually put into uh, uh, implementation. We have a, a, an advocacy uh, study that is currently ongoing. We do hope that the findings are going to be presented during the symposium that can inform how uh, the sector can be able to take forward housing in the country. Okay, all right. You mentioned gender and how a house is very important to a woman. I, I will challenge John Baptist to think about this when I come to him. Uh, isn't it as important to a woman as it is to a man? Gender applies to both <laughs> men and women. Um, uh, Robert, first tell us about the symposium. You're having the inaugural annual Uganda Housing Symposium. It's slated for the 7th of October this very same year, and you'll be hosting it at Speak Resort in Munyonyo. And the theme that it is uh, affordable and inclusive housing solutions for all and the all have been classified yes. the below the middle and of course the upper class yes and uh, I must thank the director he has articulated very well what the deliberations during the housing symposium are going to look like it is a symposium that uh, we are very delighted to host uh, a, a multidisciplinary uh, 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 group of people, the academia, the private sector, the, s the development partners. Uh, uh, at Habitat for Humanity, we are going to have all the countries where we are uh, operating visitors. All the, 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 the CEOs of the respective countries are coming in to join us in this symposium as a network. Uh, and the, the symposium, uh, our chief guest, we expect, is uh, the Right Honorable Speaker of Parliament. We expect all the, 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 the leadership of the ministry, the ministers to be present. And also we do expect um, 
uh, a high delegation of all the cultural leaders that we partner with in this country. The Buganda Kingdom is a very critical partner that we are working with, and through the Decent Living Campaign, every year, every year we build 25 homes. The Toro Kingdom that we are also launching a decent living campaign, we are committed to walk the journey with them. And then recently, the, the Bunyoro Kitara Kingdom and, the, and the, the Busoga Kingdom. So this is a cause to trigger local collective action. So the symposium is going to provide opportunities for the sector to, to rethink the issues around affordability. Okay. What works for us? And what do we need to move forward with in terms of uh, uh, b trying to bridge or reduce the housing deficit and in the country? I believe the private sector and government have had. So what is your pledge to that question? I'll start with you, George Baptist, in conclusion. Uh, about affordability? Yes, please. Yes. Um, my contribution to that, like I mentioned, there's still a lot of room for improvement. I think we need to do more about around um, sensitization of the community. Um, many of them may actually not know some of the things we are talking about. Someone borrowing as little as 200,000 shillings, taking it for, for a loan, and I'm not talking about a monthly installment. There is also flexibility. We've looked at the different customers based on what they do. We are not only talking about salary earners. There are those whose earnings are quarterly, so we structure those um, housing loans accordingly. If you're not going to be able to pay monthly, maybe you're going to be able to pay on a quarterly basis. So depending on the realities we discuss with the customers, we are able to serve those customers. Okay. But I think we have work to do in terms of sensitizing. Um, the, f the funding is available. Anyone interested, anyone who has a dream, and everyone has a dream of owning a home, a decent home. All right. So we are in the same uh, light when we are talking about affordability, decency housing, and all that comes as a pack. Oh, thank you so much, John. And finally, from the ministry's perspective, Dave, what's your pledge moving forward to what the gentlemen have presented? Thank you so much. Our pledge as government is that uh, we have done a lot of talking. The symposium will help us to, to do the real re engineering, what are the workable solutions to make housing affordable? We are going to share best practices, we are going to share innovations, we are going to share ideas and ensure that what we come out, either as a declaration or as a Kampala declaration or whatever may be, should be what we should implement to ensure that everyone is housed everyone is housed decently and the gap is narrowed we leave no place and leave no person behind all right affordability inclusion and decent housing is what we conclude this conversation with at the end of the day uh, the hope of this uh, symposium is actually to build strength stability and self-reliance through shelters so on the 7th of october 2022 at speak resort in munyonyo you are most welcome for this this, this uh, symposium and of course you can turn to social media platforms as well as the website for habitat for humanity uganda for more details and uh, signing up and making reservations in that regard. The government commits to being there and perhaps coming out with a declaration at the end of the symposium. And of course, partners such as Housing Finance Bank are also ready to contribute their part in ensuring that we have safe, affordable housing for all in Uganda. Thank you so much for having joined us. I remain Priscilla Regida Naloga. Good evening.